So what we believe about the world can be distorted by the long-term effects of repeated misinformation or the short-term effects of campaigns that carelessly, recklessly, willfully or indifferently <laughs> distort the facts. Um, in the past year, both of these effects have had significant impact around the world, most notably in the US elections or in the UK referendum. It's been summed up as a post-truth world full of fake news. And whether or not, whether or not the problem, oh, I can't read my writing. <laughs> um, so it's been summed up as a post-truth world full of fake news. Um, and whether or not you think uh, those terms are helpful, um, the problem is unmistakable. People distort facts, and we all believe crap about the world as a result. So the choice that citizens have um, is to distrust everything. That's one of them. Um, but we all need information to place trust wisely. Um, and when you don't have that, the alternatives are pretty awful. You have the choice of blind faith, trust absolutely everything that you hear, blind cynicism, distrust everything that you hear, or complete apathy, just shut off because what can you trust, who can you trust? And once you have those choices, you leave. It's a bit of a dangerous situation to be in because what you have is a civic vacuum. And there are some that are happier to fill that civic vacuum than others. So in the past, the pragmatic response was to decide what sources of information do you trust? Do you trust The Guardian? Do you trust The Daily Mail? Do you trust the BBC? Um, and even before that, when there were fewer sources, it was easier to place trust selectively. But now there are so many sources. And actually, we have partisan sources talking directly to people without any scrutiny in the middle. Slightly worrying. <laughs> and on top of that, you have modern systems and platforms that allow for the exploitation of information sharing, but without actually holding that to any kind of standards. The platforms are starting to wake up to this problem, which in part was created by them, um, I'm not here to state them, but their choices of ad revenue models and their algorithm choices have resulted in some of this. But like I said, they are beginning to wake up to this problem. And actually, Facebook released a 13-page dossier on uh, how they're going to start working on this. And they've started to make some product changes. And they've started, uh, Google have also started to highlight fact checks in search and have created a schema for fact checking, and are starting to do some interesting things in the space. So I'm me then, <laughs> and I work at Full Fact. Um, it's an independent fact checking organization. Um, and we've been at the heart of all of these questions uh, and problems since 2010. Before I hand over to Will, who's the director of Full Fact, I'd like to destroy the term fake news for you. Because fake news is a really awful term that doesn't help anyone, because the problem is much more complicated than that. It's not just one. It's being used as a catch-all to mean a lot of different things. Um, so this is from a blog post that I've just tweeted out from the Full Fact account. And it's homework for all of you. Please go and read it. If I can do one thing, if I can leave you with one thing, it's please read that blog post and stop using the term fake news. Um, fake news, the different types of it, can be broken down into one end of the spectrum, satire or parody, things that have false connections. It might be a headline that doesn't match up with the article. It might be misleading content, um, the misleading use of information to frame an issue or individual, false context, imposter context, manipulated context, or at the other end of the spectrum, totally fabricated content. So these are the different types. And then you get the different reasons why this happens. Um, it might be poor journalism. It might be to parody, to provoke, um, because they care about it. They're very passionate. It might be partisanship. It might be profit. It might be political influence or state-led propaganda. That's fake news. <laughs> and then on top of that, you also have distri different distribution mechanisms, whether it's your aunt sharing something that's wrong or a bot army at the other end that are adding um, fake amplification onto pieces of content. Um, so please go away and read that. And Will will now tell you a bit about what we do at Full Fact. Thank you. Um, I'm going to allow some other people to introduce our work before I start. <laughs> <It works. laughs> 
always. Full, full, fact. full Fact is an organization which specializes in fact-checking claims made by politicians and the media. So the panel had better watch out. We've had Full Fact. They're independent analysts. Call them Project Fact. We went through absolutely everything that was being said. How do we tell fact from fiction? Well, this man knows. Will Moy is from Full Fact, an independent fact-checking organization. Organisations like Full Fact, when they started off, were a complete culture shock to newsrooms across the country because, I think you probably admit this, he took quite a militant attitude. If we got something wrong, we would get a complaint and that complaint would then go to the PCC, as there was then, um, if, you know, if it wasn't properly resolved. And at first, you'd say, who are these people? Why are they questioning it? But actually, over the long run, it's made us all think a little bit harder. So we can accurately gauge just how posh your media consumption habits are by how many of those people you recognize. Um, we have Dimbleby, top left, the famous Dimble Bot, presenter of BBC Question Time, Allegra Stratton, national editor of BBC News, uh, ITV News, sorry, Piers Morgan and Susanna Reid, who present um, the ITV Breakfast Show, and Oliver Wright, the policy editor of The Times at the other extreme. Um, illustrating the different aspects of uh, the work that Full Fact has been doing since 2010. We are the UK's independent fact-checking charity, we are non-partisan, we are led by a cross-party board, we are running out of technology we can trust, um, thank goodness. Um, we uh, have been at the forefront of tackling misinformation in British public life since we began in 2010, and that has included the uh, AV referendum, for those of you who can remember three referendums ago, the Scottish referendum and the EU referendum, the 2015 general election and the 2017 general, general election and the Leveson inquiry, which is part of what Oliver Wright was referring to. It's our job to back journalists up in holding power to account. It's our job to recognise that journalists have power too and help the public scrutinise what we are all hearing from politicians and journalists, and as me even said, more and more directly from people without anyone in the middle checking stuff for us. And that's a real challenge. And it becomes a bigger challenge when you get fake news, a perfectly useful term that was referring to cases where people were literally making up stories on completely made up websites to get clicks on the internet in order to make advertising money. That was what was happening last year in the US election. And then it became a term that senior politicians in this country and in the US were using to trash journalists who were trying to hold them to account for the claims they were making. And that's why we have a problem with the term fake news. It's become almost a weaponized term that makes it harder for the rest of us to suss out what's going on. What I'm going to tell you about briefly is what Full Fact does to help people suss out what's going on. And then hand back over to Meven. Um, who is our digital products manager. She's in charge of all of our work on automated fact-checking to actually show you some of how we're deploying automation into our environment. So there's a famous definition of a diplomat that some of you may recognize. A diplomat is somebody who can tell you to go to hell and make you look forward to the trip. <laughs> a fact-checker is somebody who can tell you it's complicated and make it not sound patronizing. A lot of people think that our work is about bucketing things as either black or white, true or false. Actually, most of what we do is reinserting the shades of grey into the oversimplified, oversimplified public debate that we all have to live with. Of course, politicians have to campaign in bright language and clear distinctions, and we're all about to sit through about 35 more days of that. Um, 33 more days of that, is it? Four. Probably. Yeah. Um, um, but actually, it's really important to dig under those claims and understand what is actually going on. And that is basically a simple process. It starts with monitoring what people are saying, having a balanced idea of what the debate is out there, spotting the claims that are interesting, important, and influential, checking those claims so that we can trace them back to primary sources, to authoritative sources, find out what those sources say and whether they back up what is being claimed, um, about our lives, and finally publishing and putting that out to people um, so people can make up their own minds about what to trust and who to trust. So let me take you through some of the complexity of that before we talk about what parts of it can and cannot be automated, because I promise you, it would have been very easy to get somebody to come and do this talk and explain exactly how fact-checking will be automated. Your life will be neatly categorized into black and white by machine learning, and the whole problem will go away soon. 
Anyone who does that is, as most people in this room will know, a complete charlatan. That is not possible. It's not going to happen. And until somebody invents human-level AI, that's not on the table. What we are arguing is that new technology can make fact-checking dramatically more effective. But let's start with what we can't do. Firstly, how do we do balanced monitoring? Just to give you a bit of an insight into the background of full fact, this is a poll that Ipsos Mori publishes every month. They ask people, completely free response question, unprompted, what do you think are the most important issues facing Britain today? This was just released a couple of days ago. This is what we are most bothered about as a country at the moment. EU, NHS, immigration, the economy. That's kind of been a fairly consistent top four for a little while now. The EU only became the most important issue facing Britain today after the referendum. Only managed to make the number one spot after we voted to leave. Actually, the lowest point in 20 years of polling for the EU in terms of uh, issues facing Britain today was in September 2015, when only 1% of people thought it was one of the top issues facing Britain today. So less than 12 months before we all voted to leave the EU, the vast majority of people just weren't that interested in the EU which partly explains why the referendum campaign was such a challenging thing for both voters and fact-checkers. When we were all starting from such a low base of knowledge and a low base of interest, we had a really difficult time last year. Um, <laughs> so, monitoring. Balanced monitoring, fair monitoring, making sure that we're spotting what's being seen and making sure we're focusing on issues that people actually think are important and want us answers to. Then we have to spot claims. So here's a little challenge for you all. This is inevitably a room full of fairly bright people. Um, this is something we use in our recruitment process. So let's see how many of you could be a fact checker. <laughs> Question number one. The claim record numbers of people are in employment. Does that look sensible to you? Can anyone see a problem with that claim? It's vague. It's vague. Louder, please. It's, it's very vague. It's very vague. We don't can, one can one anyone one. be a bit more specific <laughs> about a problem with that claim? <laughs> Low or high? Population is increasing. Thank you very much. Record numbers of people are in employment. There are more people in this country than there ever have been before. There have been more people in this country than ever before for yonks and yonks and yonks. If you do the graph of the number of people in employment, it has been at record levels for almost every year since the 1990s, since the early 1990s. The, sorry? It's nice, nice. That is the tech explanation of it. It's a vanity metric. What you're really interested in is the employment rate, what proportion of people in the country are in employment. And actually, that did hit a record level a couple of years ago, but after the government had been using this boast um, for quite a while. Um, OK, there are 600,000 illegal immigrants in this country. What's the problem with that claim? By the way, you, sir, um, come and see me afterwards for a job. Um, <laughs> 600,000 illegal immigrants in the country. No reference point? Yep. Really important point, reference points. Remember those words. They're powerful. Anyone else? Big round number? Big round number. <laughs> Very good point. And of course, the really obvious question is, did they all line up in a row to be counted? <laughs> I mean, how on earth do you know the answer to that? If you're going to make such a bold claim about something which, by definition, people are going to make hard to count, how are you so sure? That's the question we would want to know. How do you know that? On average, people spend £10 a week on rail fares. Anyone? Louder, please. Point estimate. Point estimate. Point estimate. Nice. But actually, oh. The, the average is important. Well done, sir. Averages can be so deceptive. Who are the people? Are they commuters who buy rail tickets every day, or are they all of us who don't buy rail tickets every day? Because actually, if you account all of us, you drop the number massively, but you give a massively <laughs> unrepresentative idea of what most people who spend money on rail tickets actually spend. Everyone getting the hang of this so far? This is what we call the bullshit filter. <laughs> it's the idea that you can look at something and have a healthy idea of what question we should be asking about it. 22 million people watched the election debates in 2010. There were three different election debates. If you add up the, the viewership of all of those debates, then you get to 22 million, assuming nobody watched all three. Now, that may seem like a reasonable assumption to many of you, but I promise you, I did. All of my <laughs> colleagues did. We were there. Some other people probably did too. We're spending more than ever before on flood defences. Spending over time is completely screwed up by inflation. Your Mars bar 
does not cost now what it did when you were a kid. Neither do flood defenses cost now what they did three years ago. You cannot just compare the raw numbers without factoring in inflation. And finally, my favorite, local authorities in the UK spend 500 billion pounds on street lighting. Anyone see the problem with that? Over what period? Very fair question. Anyone else? Also, you're already hired, so you know. <laughs> <laughs> Gentlemen in the back there. New street lights or repaired street lights? Completely reasonable. Gentlemen there. Is it talking about capital or ongoing expenses? Capital or ongoing expenses, so maintenance expenses. It's out by a thousand times. It's a million pounds. Just to give you an idea, the total public sector spending in this country is about 700 billion pounds. <laughs> if we spent five out of every seven pounds we spend, on the, the government spends on our behalf, on street lighting, this could possibly be true. It cannot possibly be true. That is more than four times what we spend on the NHS. That got through <laughs> a Daily Mail reporter, a Daily Mail sub-editor, the Daily Mail editor, and into the paper and nobody saw that billions were meant to be millions. Mistakes happen. It's our job to help people avoid those mistakes. So checking things is hard. You need quite good instincts. You need actually quite a lot of background knowledge. You need quite a lot of reference points. You need quite a lot of concepts that you can throw into this mix. And the more you throw them into the mix, the more we realize that actually fact checking is hard and fact checking becomes harder when you turn it into an NLP problem, a natural language problem of taking computers and asking them to understand all of those nuances and all of these complexities. So let's take a fairly simple claim like crime has doubled in the past 10 years. Actually, that's a fairly reasonable claim. You can begin to see how a computer might get a handle on that claim. Let's get the crime data. Let's um, go back 10 years. Let's um, work out whether now is 10 times 10 years ago. All fine and fair enough, right? And more or less, what a presumably very intelligent and bright researcher for the Liberal Democrats did in preparing their man manifesto for the last general election. He went, he got the crime figures over their period in government, and he said, crime has fallen by 10% over the Lib Dem period in government. Unfortunately, there are two different measures of crime in this country. You can either look at how many crimes the police record, which is massively dependent on what the police are doing with their time, or you can look at the crime survey, which asks people, have you been a victim of crime, which is much more stable over time. The Lib Dems, unfortunately, shows the police recorded crime survey, which you shouldn't use for that kind of counting. Um, and particularly, unfortunately, for them, because actually, if they'd have used the right measure, crime had fallen by more than 20%. So they rather <laughs> undersold their own record in their own ma manifesto uh, because they weren't aware of what stats to use and when. Fact checking is hard. And the more complicated the claims we make, the more complicated the language, the more complicated the concepts. Um, things like the Obama administration since the recession, vagueness of the way we talk as human beings, all of these create challenges for automating fact-checking. But here's another challenge. This graph, really, really simple. Okay, this really is simple, right? Let's leave aside the methodological complexity of running a census, and let's just say we're basically counting heads of how many people are in the country, right? That's fairly simple. So answer me just one question. In the 19-teens which obviously is around the First World War, there is a massive dip in the UK's population. Around the time of the Second World War, there is no such dip. Who, who I've already not hired, and the gentleman in, over there has also been offered a job, um, who, who I've not already hired knows why there is a difference between the First World War and the Second World War? Gentleman in front. Spanish flu. Spanish flu. Any advance on Spanish flu? I've got a Spanish flu here, Spanish flu here. Any advance on Spanish flu? Gentleman back. The gentleman back louder, please. Damn, I hate going to these kinds of places. It usually <laughs> takes at least five guesses. Yeah. So statisticians defined the population of the UK in the First World War as excluding servicemen stationed abroad. And so when they came back, when they were demobilized after the First World War, the population of the UK went back up to almost where it was beforehand. So what happened after the First World War? Obviously, they changed the rules in the, in the Second World War period. What happened after the First World War? Why did the population fall so much? We've got Spanish flu as an opening guess, right? Any advance on Spanish flu? Counting in a different way? Louder, sorry? Changing of methods of counting? Changing government accounting? So we've decided that people are no longer people? <laughs> Anyone else? Oh, no, he said changing the way you count. 
a change in the way you count. Uh, yep. Yeah, OK, that's a perfectly reasonable idea. We had some really, <laughs> so is your first one, by the way. I'm coming to it. Um, we had some really embarrassing adjustments in our immigration measures in the late 90s, precisely because statisticians had to do that, but not this time. Gentleman over there. Say again. Was it? Colonies. Losing colonies. Sort of, yeah. This is when the Irish Free State left the United Kingdom. This is not the same country at the beginning of a graph as the end of a graph. <laughs> this is a set of figures that look so straightforward that you would look at and rely on. You will have seen people say, this is what happens adjusted for population over time. Ask yourself whether they knew that and whether they got it right. Fact checking is hard because you have to know your sources. You have to know your questions. You have to know what the data can and cannot do. And then you have to know whether there is data or not. So we spent two weeks in the EU referendum trying to answer the very simple question of where, how many companies in the UK exported to the rest of the EU. You would think, A, this is a simple question, and B, somebody would have thought to answer it before we held a referendum on our membership of the EU. <laughs> right? We ended up talking to the Office for National Statistics, Department for Business, and two other government departments, HMRC and somebody else, about whether they had any figures on this. None of them did. There ended up being three different data sets. It took us three weeks, two weeks to get that much information out of people, and we only did it by ringing up the head of profession in each government department and telling them to get a grip, politely. Um, that is the kind of work that fact-checking does. It is painstaking. It is often painful. It is done on your behalf to make sure that you have information you can rely on, whether people are making mistakes or misrepresenting things. It's our job to help anchor public debate to reality. And that's what we're gearing up to do in this election. Over the course of the last two weeks, we have slept very little, but worked to double our team, bring in lots of extra people, both working on the communication side and working on the research side. We're taking in secondees from the House of Commons Library, the nonpartisan people who do research for MPs in this country, and from the Office for National Statistics coming into our team, bringing their expertise into our work. We're bringing in people to help us communicate more effectively in digital, and we're bringing in people who can help us uh, get our message out in the media as well. All of this is tiring, really, really tiring, and really quite expensive. We'll be mentioning this again later, but we are running a crowdfunder right now. We really need your support. 900 people are already making this possible. You could be the next 100 people. If we could get to 1,000 today, that would be amazing. That would make this work possible. So I just want to leave you with this thought and hand over to me then to answer this question. Actually, much of what we do is mechanical. Yes, you need the brilliant researchers who will trace things around half a dozen government departments when everyone else has given up, who will ask the question where the press office replies, well, nobody else has asked that. But actually, a lot of the time, it's politicians making the same claim we've already seen that we need to respond to quickly. We've all heard our party leaders repeat themselves endlessly. We have to tackle that problem. And a lot of the time, it's just a variation on a claim with figures we've seen before. Andrew Ring has this inspiring idea for the Industrial Revolution freed us from physical drudgery. AI can free us from repetitive mental drudgery. I am the repetitive mental drudge. Mevan is the liberator, and she'll now tell you a bit about how she's going to liberate our team. It's very kind and overwhelming. Okay. <laughs> um, so um, there's no way that we're going to be able to replace our fact checkers anytime soon. So therefore, what can we do now? Because we are, we are 12 people and we are bombarded with information and claims day in, day out, and things are spreading faster than ever before, and fact-checking isn't keeping up. So that's, that was the big question we asked ourselves. What are the things that we can build now, and how can we free up our fact-checkers to work on the more complicated claims, like is the NHS in crisis versus what is the population of the UK? Um, and we're not waiting for the amazing advancements in research. We're not waiting for the neural nets to be trained or speech-to-text to be 100% accurate. We want to put tools in the hands of fact-checkers at the end of the year, actually now due to the snap election in a couple of weeks. <laughs> um, so we are building an automated fact-checking engine. It does two things. It sounds really scary, but it's not. It does two things. It spots claims that we've already checked in new places. Uh, and when you're sitting on 5,000 claims and politicians repeat themselves all the time, and you have a pretty good cross-section of all the political claims in the country, that's quite powerful by itself. Um, the second thing it does is it detects new claims automatically and surfaces the data to fact check it, 
we are very lucky to live in a data-rich country. We work uh, with fact-checkers in Argentina and af across Africa who do not have the same resources that we have. So because of the work with the ONS and because of the fact that they are pushing forward with their API and making it far more nuanced, we can start to do things like this. So the, the things that it actually does, really simply, is does the monitoring, the spotting, and with the second mode, the checking. So it monitors um, Hansard, everything that is said in Parliament. Currently, they're on recess, or they will be. Yep, so um, they're not saying anything anymore, but we do have everything they've ever said. And that's a pretty good precursor to figure out what they might say. Um, we are also monitoring uh, newspapers. So what are the cross-section of online newspapers saying across the country? Um, we're also working on TV subtitles. So. At the moment, we're monitoring BBC One, BBC Two, BBC News. Um, and we're hoping to extend that for the election to all the other broadcasters. Broadcast is actually really important because that's how people get their information. 66% of people get their news from TV. Um, and we like to think that the internet is actually how everyone gets the news. But really, if you're talking about the cross-section of the country, it's still, the ball game is still TV. Um, cool. On top of this engine. What are we building? They're two fun things. Um, we're building something called Trends and something called Live. Uh, Trends is a monitoring tool, and it allows us to see who is repeating known misinformation. We are quite unique as fact checkers because we do more than just fact check. We also get corrections. Um, so we're the reason, actually, that the Daily Mail and the Sun have corrections columns. You can thank us later. Um, <laughs> um, Phoebe, our colleague, works on figuring out who are the people who are repeating pieces of known information. And she spends a lot of time going back and forth trying to get corrections requests. The first corrections request took how many months? Nine? Nine months. Nine months. Uh, now we've got that down to hours or days. And actually, uh, during, um, was it the EU referendum? No, it was 2010. It was a 2010 general election. We managed to get a correction in Newsnight in the same program. <laughs> that was amazing. Was, at the beginning of the show, they said something was totally wrong. We tweeted them. We got in touch with the editor. And at the end of the show, they corrected themselves. In so, 2015. In 2015, sorry. Yeah. So that's fact checked. Um, <laughs> so that's we, we, the point of trends is to be able to target that work more effectively and to figure out if our interventions are actually working is going, actually, you should tell the story about Frederick Forsyth. Okay. Or, or maybe I should talk about trends first. I should show Shady. trends. Yeah. This is a shitty mock-up that we did of what it might look like. <laughs> <laughs> um, this, was, <laughs> this was for a funding application where they want to see what like, exciting thing you might be building. Um, it doesn't look like this anymore. <laughs> um, but basically, imagine a claim that we have already fact-checked. There's a 38 billion pound black hole in the defense budget. Um, and the conclusion, it's an, it's an unsubstantiated claim. We have no idea where the information comes from. And then you have all of the sightings, the most recent sightings, and you get to aggregate the information over time. And if you intervene at this point, or this point, or whatever, and you can see in a known decrease, you can actually see that you have had an effect in the world. That's really valuable for us, because at the moment, it's really vague. We don't really know. It's kind of a nebulous, like, Talking to the world is very nebulous. <laughs> there, there aren't many metrics when it comes to fact checking. So, the Frederick Forsyth story, which I've just written the punchline for. Um, <laughs> so, so, what Meva means by targeting this kind of work is that we, this was one of the first claims we put into our first prototype of this system. And it's been a claim that's bugged us for a long time because MPs and the National Audit Office and we and lots of other people have asked the government to justify it and they never ever gave us a good reason why it should be thought to be true. So then we put it into trends, and we found out that half the people making this claim were Frederick Forsyth. And so actually, it's completely unsubstantiated. And now we know how to stop it. Let's take Frederick Forsyth out for a really good lunch, lunch. and persuade him that there is no known basis for this claim. And we can cut the spread of it in half. That's a much, much more powerful thing than just finding one instance of a claim and uh, tackling one instance at a time. And that's, the, uh, that's how much it will scale up our work, and that's how much it will make our work more efficient. Could, could you get up what trends look like now? Because I yeah, can't yeah. make your computer work without the fan exploding. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, let's, let's not bet on that. Um, um, so this so is... This is go ahead. for Google Book? Yeah, go ahead. 
<laughs> okay, this is a, so Google are now uh, featuring fact checks in search, um, which is a very recent development, which is quite cool. Um, so if you look for, it costs you 20, actually that's wrong. It should be 230,000, but this was done in a hurry. <laughs> to, train, <laughs> to train a doctor, it will say, full fact, have an article on that. This is the claim. This is who it was claimed by, and here's the fact check. So if you then click on that fact check, it will take you to the fact check that we have written on that piece, if we're lucky. Yep. Uh, there's the crowdfunder on the slide, if you want to donate. Um, <laughs> uh, so because I'm logged in, and it's not public yet, uh, there is this more button. Um, and if you click that, it will take you to a page of what trends looks like at the moment, um, if we're lucky. So we have all of these claims and conclusions that we have already fact-checked. Um, and I can tell you that we've seen this claim 142 times since an unknown time. Um, <laughs> and. Because we're actually, uh, our tech team is basically Will and Jenna, who's sitting over there, and Skelly, who has joined us this week. Um, we haven't really got the resources to be building incredible, robust things that look incredibly pretty. The stuff that we've been working on is just proof of concept more than anything. And we've been working on a lot of funding applications to hire some developers eventually. Um, <laughs> But you can see last year's row about junior doctors really clearly. Last autumn, that was the row people were having. And you can really see that claim spiking at that time. So you begin to get a glimpse of why this stuff can be important for us. And then you get to see the sightings of that claim below. There's quite a few from the Daily Mail. <laughs> um, there's some from the Scotsman, but the, the Guardian and Times. But actually, this stuff is also, at the moment, bringing up false positives. Matching isn't very accurate right now. There is a lot of low-hanging fruit in order to improve that. Um, the matching is being done by solar um, at the moment, which needs a lot more customizing. Um, so that's, that's kind of trends. Have I missed yeah. anything out? Nope. OK. The other tool is far more exciting. <laughs> um, this is primarily for fact checkers. It's about us targeting our own work, us quantifying our own impact in the world. Live is the other tool, and it's for fact checkers and journalists primarily. Um, for the time being, anyway. Um, it's, a, it's a live fact-checking tool. Um, we pioneered live fact-checking in 2010. Um, what that means is that we take a whole team, usually, and watch a political program or go to the studios of an election debate. Um, and within seconds of somebody making a claim, we tweet a fact-check of it. We are there to give people the information they need to make sense of what they just heard. Is it fair? Is it true? Is it representative of the wider picture? Um, so, Live has, we, we started thinking, uh, the head of news gathering at Sky said, it's, I can't remember the exact quote, but he basically said it was only possible to do live fact checking um, mm -hmm. because we had full fact with us. And Ian Dale at the LBC has also said, I wish you were sitting beside me every single time I interviewed a politician. So we started thinking, how could we actually make that happen? By the end of the EU referendum and by the end of the general election, it was just like playing bingo. We knew what they were going to say. It was like whack-a-mole. We knew what they were going to say. It was just about copying the tweet and posting it at the right time. It, what, there was very little like, research that we had to do up front, because it it's all been done before. Um, that's that a very was by debate number three. <laughs> yeah. um, so we started thinking about a tool that could, in real time, take a transcript or subtitles and then match against our database of claims in real time. Um, and this is what it currently looks like. Um, oh. So this is not exciting. Let me just refresh it. Um, at the moment, it is monitoring BBC News, BBC One, BBC Two. And I'm just going to put it on a PMQ's demo if it ever works. <laughs> okay, we don't need to. It's basically, it should. Um, this is a transcript of something that happened of uh, Theresa May and Jeremy Corbyn talking past each other at PMQs. Um, and the subtitles at the bottom are coming up in real time. It is a demo, but it, 
if you look at BBC News and BBC One, it's coming up in real time, and it will actually match against our database um, so that we don't need an experienced fact checker to be working on something really mechanical. We don't need them to be looking up that fact check that we did that while ago and posting the conclusion. We can get them working on something like we are spending 1.3 billion for our, for our NHS this year. Um, yeah, it will help. <laughs> so um, I don't know if this will be running fully, but um, as, as it pops up, basically every line that comes out of the subtitles is broken up into sentences, run through a search system, a store query search system called LUAC. If it finds a match, it pops up the claiming conclusion and a one button option to tweet it. Um, if we then take that to the next level, um, yes, this is super useful for us. This is tools that we expect to put in the hands of newsrooms and journalists by the end of the year for testing and working on the accuracy to make that work is the next big step. You can see already, though, that this will change our election. This will change our ability to respond quickly and effectively to politicians, particularly on air, when you only have a few minutes to get the right information to journalists so they can respond. But let's think about how that then jumps into what we could offer the public. And this is um, the final thing we want to demo. I don't think it's the right one. Damn it. <laughs> it's damn the it. Wrong one. Damn it. Do you have a URL? You uh, stole the time. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so under, underneath all of this is a few things going on. The monitoring engine, engine is Apache Solar. The store query engine doing the real time searching is called LUAC, developed by an open source search company called Flax. All of it's running on um, hardware donated by ByteMark, um, who are a lovely hosting firm up in Yorkshire. Uh, the nerd hosting outfit of choice very kindly donated that and supported our work. They are in the process of sticking a TV antenna on their data center so we can feed these subtitles in. Can we not get it? I mean, Dive into my emails and grab it. You're not logged in. To full facts. The other. No, but you're not logged into the full fact account and it's unlinked. You're not going to see it. That's incredibly lame. It's okay. I will tweet it out and you guys will see it. Um, <laughs> so, Mevan attended a Facebook hackathon um, a couple of uh, weeks ago and Facebook was super excited to see this demo. And she worked with a team on Facebook Live to integrate that real time, sub that real -time fact checking API into Facebook Live. So, the demo that we would like to be able to play you is of somebody watching Prime Minister's questions, Prime Minister and Jeremy Corbyn arguing um, on Facebook, in Facebook Live, with real-time fact-checking flashing up on top of that video in real time so that no longer can politicians kind of go out there and put out claims that aren't backed up without giving people context in real time. Um, sticking all of this system together is basically lots and lots of Python code. We're running into NLP using Stanford Core NLP, Python code gluing together the monitoring engine, um, the uh, format in which we load into Solar, and all of the external products are run in Python or in Django. We want to expand this platform massively, both in terms of what we can monitor, monitoring more online sources, monitoring more media sources. We also want to expand it in terms of accuracy and in terms of automated fact checking. So we have working code already for assessing statistical claims, understanding what claims are being made going back to original data, going back to our database of caveats, sticking all that together and automatically reaching a verdict about whether those claims are true or not. All of that, again, built in Python um, using natural language processing, basically core NLP um, and dependency parsing and that kind of toolkit. If any of that sounds interesting to you, there are three ways you can support our work. The first is by going to crowdfunder.co.uk slash full dash fact. We really need your help. This is the most restful week of our, hour of our week. Um, we are having a hell of an election on no notice. If you can support our crowdfunder, that would be amazing. The second thing is, come along and meet us this afternoon. We're hosting a hackathon, um, cunningly in a room with no plugs, so please charge your laptops in advance. But we're hosting a hackathon, um, and you'll be able to get your hands on some of this tech and work with Skelly and Jenna in the third row there. Stick your hands up. Um, our lovely, lovely tech team um, to try and move some of this stuff forward and bring it forward so it's ready for this election. So come and get piled in there. The third thing is we are shortly hoping to announce that we have funding to hire some people to work on this project full time. If you think these tools look cool and if you think these tools should be a damn sight better and if you have 
experience of Python, experience of search, experience of natural language, processing, any subset of that, um, then come and talk to us and um, let us know that you're interested because we are looking for really great tech people who are nice and who can communicate to join our team and help um, turn fact checking into automated fact checking and let our fact checkers do more work better. That, I think, is all we have time for. Um, so thank you very much. If you have questions, come and grab us. We would be very happy to chat.